Okay, so uh, Brandon, if we could go to our first slide. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, so today we are going to talk about marriage and we can go to the next slide. Okay, so in Jewish law, there are two parts of the wedding ceremony. There's the first part called Kiddushin, which is the technical engagement ceremony. And then Nisuin, which is the actual wedding. It used to be in the Talmudic times and you know, a long time ago that these would be two separate events and they would be separated by a year or so. Now it's both of them are part of the wedding ceremony. So Kiddushin, does anybody recognize anything about that word? Is there anything familiar about that word? Yes. Kiddush. Kiddush. Kiddush, right. Kiddush, Kadosh, all of that connected to the word for holy. So holy, believe it or not, the word Kiddush or Kadosh started off as really meaning separate because when you give something to the temple for the priests and for God, you are separating a member of your flock part of your grain harvest, whatever it is, you're separating that from your common use and you're designating it as specifically for God. So it's a holy thing. And so therefore Kiddushin means really setting apart. Now this is not gonna make those of us who are feminists too happy, but the original meaning for Kiddushin in the marriage ceremony is that now the woman is being set apart specifically for the man. So in other words, she cannot be with any other man. And that's what the Kiddushin part of the ceremony is all about. So now she's engaged essentially. And when it was a year apart from the actual wedding, of, from the actual nuptials, she was still set apart for the husband. So if she engaged in extramarital hanky-panky, she was committing adultery. Okay, so there's a story in the Bible that some of you may know, which is the story of Tamar and Judah. So Judah is one of the sons of Jacob. And he married, his son marries a woman named Tamar. And for some reason, the son dies. So there's something called leveret marriage in Judaism. It's, really the traditional, you know, in the Torah and still exists in some cases. Um, if you die, if your husband dies without a male heir, then the wife, the widow is supposed to then marry the brother and produce a male heir for, in the name of the dead brother. So when Tamar's husband dies, she then marries her second husband, who is the brother, whose name is Onan. Onan doesn't particularly want to make a child that's going to carry his brother's name because then that kid's going to get all this inheritance and it's not going to be passed down to his own kids. So he, quote, spills his seed. That's where the word Onanism comes from, by the way. Little, little known fact, right? Um, so he spills the seed and God does not like that at all. So God strikes that guy down. And now you've got the third brother. Well, what do you think Judah's going to think about that? I don't think I want to give my youngest son to this woman because then this guy's going to die too. So he withholds the son from Tamar. However, because of the leveret marriage obligation, they are essentially engaged to each other. So as long as she's engaged to this guy, she cannot marry anyone else. She cannot have you know, intercourse with anybody else. And in this particular case, Judah is withholding the son that she is supposed to marry. So at a certain point, she disguises herself as a prostitute and sleeps with Judah. And he, of course, doesn't recognize her. There's all these stories in the Bible about how these guys never recognize the women that they're sleeping with. That's a whole other story we could talk about. And so they end up, she ends up getting pregnant. Well, he doesn't know that he slept with his daughter-in-law, right? He only knows that he slept with some prostitute. 
okay. When he finds out that she is pregnant, he says she must be, I can't remember, it's burned or stoned, something charming like that, because you are not allowed to engage in adultery. And that's adultery. That means that you, adultery means that a woman who is, belongs to a man has had sexual relations with someone who's not her husband. The married man can have sexual relationship with a woman and that is not considered adultery. Only the woman because she is somebody else's property. So he says she should be stoned or burned or whatever it is. And she makes him realize that he's the one who slept with her and PS everything works out fine. And their great, great, great grandchildren are, end up being King David. Okay, so it all works out fine. But that just gives you an idea of the idea that when you are married, engaged or whatever, you cannot commit adultery as a woman. Now that doesn't mean the man is scot-free if he commits adultery, which is only with a married woman. But again, if he's married and he has relationships with another woman, no, no problem, okay? So I'm just giving you the sort of basis of marriage in Judaism, traditionally. Yes, Christine. Um, the, uh, first of all, I think that the uh, not knowing the, the woman with whom you're sleeping, I think those people became senators, but, but the, <laughs> okay. But, but, the, um, but the other thing is uh, if Tamar had been pregnant or if they didn't know if she were pregnant, then she would she still have been stoned or does that uh or is it basically that you can stone anybody until the time of quickening at which point you can't okay that's a whole other issue which is abortion and that yeah. is that until the until major the quickening right well until the major part of the body is out yeah, it's not considered an actual life yet. Exactly. So exactly. actually, Jewish law is much more um, liberal about well, liberal about abortion than let's say yeah. you know Catholicism. But that's not what they're worried about here. They're worried about the fact that she's somebody else's you know property and she allowed herself to be used by someone. So okay. it's it's more about that. Okay, we can go back to the um, to the slideshow. Thank you. Okay. So, and we're talking about traditional wedding, okay? Generally, it's on the, the right index finger that the ring is put on. And that is, well, we're gonna go into the ceremony in a bit, but the ceremony is about transferring something of value to the bride. And it's a, the ring is the, the piece of value. It's supposed to be a plain gold uh, ring with no diamonds on it or anything else. The groom in Hebrew is called a chatan, and the bride is a kala. And what he says to her, and we'll go into the whole uh, layout of the service, but this is the kiddushin moment. This is when he essentially is acquiring her. Okay, he says, I'm going to do it in Hebrew first. Hare at mekudeshet li betaba'at zu kadat Moshe v'Yisrael. Now it's very beautifully translated here as you are consecrated to me through this ring, according to the religion of Moses and Israel. But really, hare at mekudeshet. Mekudeshet includes that word, kadosh. So really what he's saying is, behold, you are being set aside for me. And since the word for set aside and consecrated are connected, it's much nicer to say consecrated. But really and truly, this is an acquisition of property. Again, traditionally, I'm not saying that that's how the reform movement does it today. Or maybe some Orthodox might not say that that's what it is, but that is what it is. And all the woman gets to do is if she says no, then it's no. But otherwise, she doesn't say anything. So the groom puts this ring on her. He acquires her by accepting the ring. She's accepting that. And of course, in egalitarian weddings, we don't have the bride be silent. She says a similar thing to him. Hare ata mekudashli. Behold, you are consecrated to me as well with this ring, etc. Okay, next slide, please. 
All right. One of the things that we do in a Jewish wedding is we draw up a wedding contract, and that is called a ketubah. And here are two people holding their beautiful ketubah and smiling. Uh, next slide, please. The ketubah, which is the wedding contract, you might think, oh, well, this is acquiring a woman and therefore this is like not really such a great thing. Well, actually the ketubah was a protection for the woman so that the husband does not take lightly the possibility of divorce. So in other words, I acquire a woman, I'm sick of her, eh, I'm going to toss her out. No, it doesn't work that way because the ketubah basically says that there's a certain amount of property that will go to her if he divorces her or if he dies. So in the ketubah, traditionally, the man takes upon himself the obligation to provide his wife with three major things, clothing, food, and conjugal relations. And by the way, the Talmud specifies that according to the particular job that the guy has, he has to have sexual relations with her once a week, three times a week, once a month, whatever it is, okay? There, that's the obligation that he has. He also agrees in this ketubah to pay her a specified amount of money. Now, in order to acquire a bride, you go to the father and you offer 200 zuz, that was the measure of, of money at the time, if she's a virgin, and 100 if she's a widow, a convert, or a divorced woman. Of course, not 100 zuz if she happens to be a non-married woman who had sex with men. No, that, that's like used goods, forget it. And as you may have heard that once you marry a woman who's supposed to be a virgin, you then have a sheet to prove that that's the case because obviously with a virgin, there's gonna be blood. Now, if she's been married before or she's converted or she's a divorced woman, then you pay less. And that goes into her property that she will get when and if there is a divorce. There's also her uh, dowry that she brings into the marriage. So it could be you know, a plot of land or something like that. And the husband can benefit from it but the principle is going to go back to her if, as I said, there's a divorce or a death. The ketubah is signed by two witnesses and it's read aloud under the chuppah during the ceremony. Now, the witnesses are supposed to be halachically valid Jews. Halachically means that they're, they follow Jewish, uh, the mitzvot, the uh, commandments. So somebody who observes Shabbat, who observes the kosher laws. Again, this is only in very, uh, you know, like orthodox settings. I certainly, when I, when I do a wedding, I certainly don't ask the witness if they observe Shabbat, but they have to be Jewish. And in orthodox Judaism, women are not considered to be valid witnesses. So in an orthodox wedding, only men are gonna sign it. I personally, of course, count women in you know, the, the signing of the, of the ketubah. Um, there's a very nice tradition in, in the Sephardic world where actually a whole bunch of people sign the ketubah all the way around the ketubah, um, but you need two witnesses. And actually you don't really need, in, in the Jewish part of the wedding, you actually don't need an officiant. You just need two witnesses to say this really happened. Um, only because like in California or in the other states in the US, you do need somebody who is uh, you know, allowed by the state to actually perform a legal wedding. But in a, in, for the Jewish part of it, you don't need, actually need a rabbi. Okay, next slide, please. So I'm gonna just give, show you a few examples of ketubahs. The ketubah, here you have on the left, the, the English and on the right, the Hebrew. Um, it's, you can make it as beautiful as you want. You can get a very simple one, or you can spend a lot of money getting uh, artwork done for it. Let's look at the next one. So here's a beautiful one with some peacocks on it. And I think this one is entirely in Hebrew. It just depends. Uh, next one. There's another. So, it, you know, there are all sorts of different designs that you can get. You can go online and you can find all sorts of wonderful examples. Um, and then you see at the bottom, it's very hard to read here, but uh, you have the two ed is the word in Hebrew for a witness. You have the two witnesses 
And then you have the bride and the groom and you have, uh, I think the rabbi, yeah, the rabbi's over here. Uh, but I don't actually, as a, I don't really need to sign the ketubah. I, I have on occasion signed it as a witness. But again, you know, we, we do it a little bit differently uh, if we're not in the Orthodox world. Um, please go on to the next one. Oh, Che was, I'm sorry, Che, I, I guess I have the wrong, the wrong email for you. I apologize. Well, you can look at the, you can look at the recording at the beginning of this. All right, so this is a traditional ketubah. On whatever day of the week, the day of the Hebrew month of, now day of the week means, you know, if it's the fifth day of the week, if it's the third day of the week, whatever, and the year after the creation of the world, because in Hebrew, we count the year based on when the world was created. So right now it's the year 5781, which means that we believe, well, if you are traditional, you believe the world was created 5,781 5, years ago, according to the manner in which we count dates here in, and then, you know, a, a lot of times we'll also put the, the uh, date here in, in the US. Uh, the bridegroom, son of so-and-so said to this daughter, daughter of so-and-so, be my wife, according to the law of Moses in Israel. Again, this is slightly euphemistically written out because um, it's really, uh, you are consecrated to me or set aside for me. I will work honor for you to support you in the custom of Jewish men, which means I will provide you with food, clothing, and sexual relations. Um, and I'm gonna give you the settlement of X amount of Zuzim, uh, as well as your food, clothing, necessities of life and conjugal needs. There it is written according to the universal custom. Okay, so this is what a traditional ketubah would say. Next slide. And this lady agreed to, be, to have, become his wife. As I said, she can agree or not agree, but that's about all she usually is allowed to say. And she brings a dowry along with her and it could be furnishings, it could be silver, gold, whatever. And it's worth X amount of money. And that goes into that property that she's entitled to if he leaves her or he dies. And then he's gonna, you know, add whatever amount of money and there we have the money transaction. And this is by the way, why you cannot get married on Shabbat because this is a commercial transaction, right? Okay, next please. Um, and so here the bridegroom says the obligation of this marriage contract, this dowry and this additional amount I accept upon myself and upon my heirs after me, it can be paid for the entire best part of the property. So in other words, you know, we've calculated that this is how much you brought, the woman has brought to the marriage. And here's how much I'm gonna to have to give her uh, in the future. And, uh, you know, this is a lot of technical language, but basically, and she becomes the, um, the first creditor. So in other words, if he owes money to other people, she, she gets to get the money first. Okay, next slide, please. So this is more sort of legalistic language about how all of this money is due to her. And uh, as you see at the bottom, we have completed the act of acquisition for Mr. So-and-so, right? Of his lovely daughter. And the word for acquisition in Hebrew is kinyan. And there you have it right there. And everything is valid and confirmed. Okay, next please. And then you have the two witnesses, which should have been on the same page, but I couldn't fit it all in the, on the one slide. All right, let's look at a more egalitarian ketubah. Okay, so then this, on this day of great celebration and joy, on the day of the week, the day of the month, et cetera, and the year, so-and-so and daughter so-and-so spoke the word. So it's not that he's you know, acquiring her, they together spoke these words, performed the rites which united their lives and affirmed their love in the presence of God's blessings and in accordance with the laws of Moses in Israel. And then, you know, a lot of times people will add nice things like this. Our lives together are nourished by the truth that genuine friendship is a source of vibrant and everlasting love. We promise to be honest and gentle, anticipating our milestones, celebrating our successes, honoring our uniqueness and striving to paint the future with confident strokes of kindness. So this is not, you know, the wording of an egalitarian ketubah. It is one of the ways you can word it. You can pretty much say what you want. We promise to respect each other. We promise to help each other achieve our fullest uh, potential. Uh, it's something that you can write in uh, 
or there are, of, of course, some templates out there that you can choose from. Uh, next slide, please. Our love forever will be an inspiration to family, friends, and others who are or will be in love. We are trust honored caretakers, will delight in elegant freedom born from mutual respect. Our laughter sparkling is our song. I mean, as I said, this is a particular, particularly colorful one. Um, and it can include this language or not, depending on what you want. And it says it's valid and binding, which you saw in the traditional ketubah. We said it was valid and binding because in the Orthodox community, it is a legally binding document. For us who are in the reform movement and believe in egalitarian ketubahs and egalitarian relationships, this is not a binding contract in the same sense because it is not a traditional ketubah. And you see here, you have, ooh, the bride's missing from this. I don't know what happened to her, she fell off. Okay, I, I probably, she probably dropped out because there wasn't enough room, but she should be on here. So it's the groom, the bride, two witnesses and the rabbi. Okay, let's, uh, let's come back together uh, and stop sharing. Any, any questions, comments? Uh, I, uh, Beverly, I know you grew up in a very uh, orthodox, environment. And so I'm sure this uh, brings back uh, not such pleasant memories. <laughs> and uh, hopefully uh, we will move past that uh, very uh, paternalistic uh, system. Okay, uh, questions. Christine. I, I was told that um, for in, in the traditional uh, versions, that the ketubah was the one time when women could in their own agency enter into a contract. Well, because they can say no. Yeah, right. But that's about it. That's the one time in their lives, right? Right. They cannot initiate divorce, which we, we will talk about. And that was one question. The other yeah, we'll question was we'll about, uh, the other question was that uh, in the version of Leverett that was the case then, um, was it possible for women to simply marry someone that was in the same patrilineage? It's supposed to be the brother that man was living with. In other words, people would live in, you know, larger yeah. clans. They didn't live yeah. in individual houses like we do today. Yeah. What you'll see when we get to the book of Ruth, which we will eventually, mm -hmm. there's a claim that Boaz has to marry Ruth out of Leverett obligation, but it's actually not in fact the case because they have absolutely no relationship that would require that. But that's a whole other story. And that's sort of a ruse that was done in order to allow him to marry her. Um, yeah. Okay, thank uh, you. Other questions? Oh, I have one. Please. Um, well, two questions. One, do you perform uh, same sex marriages? Yes, I do. Okay, and number two, what were you going to tell us about the fact that in the past the, the, the guys don't recognize who they sleep with? <laughs> well, I, I don't know that I was going to tell you anything. It's just that it seems to happen over and over again. Like Jacob, who oh. travels to Haran and meets Rachel and falls madly in love with her and kisses her and cries and all of that, um, and then works for seven years for his father-in-law in order to marry her, the night of the wedding the father slips in his, her older sister and he doesn't seem to notice. Whoa. The next morning, guess what? He's married to her because there's several <laughs> ways you can get married. You can either do a contract, you can sleep together and sleeping together was the way it happened a lot of times in the Bible. That's mm. not the way we do it today, obviously. But um, yeah, he didn't notice that it was Leah instead of Rachel. Wow. And Judah doesn't notice that it's his daughter-in-law. There's something fishy about this. There's something very fishy, but you know, as I said, that's a topic for another day. You know, there's a whole thing in the Bible, in the book of Numbers, about the sota. So the sota is a woman who is uh, suspected by her husband of having an affair. Suspected. It doesn't mean that there's any proof of any kind, he just suspects it. Now, in order to stop him from going home and like beating the hell out of her, He's supposed to go to the priest or to the high priest at the temple. This is in the book of Numbers, right before we had modern society. And the priest is supposed to administer this like disgusting thing that she drinks. You're saying that, yeah. And in order to prove whether or not, now, this, the, actually in other cultures, 
I've heard that in order to prove that she's not an adulterer, she has to be thrown into a river. And if she drowns, she's innocent. Don't even ask. Okay. Oh. Anyway, in this case, I think it's set up so that she ends up actually not being guilty because her belly, if her belly distends and whatever else, then she's guilty. Anyway, I think it's a whole sort of ruse by the priest to get the, the husband to calm down and to prove that she's not guilty. And then of course she gets to go home to be with this like guy who accused her and who brought her through this terrible trial. Mm -hmm. um, but, and there's a whole tractate in the Talmud called Sota, which is based on this. I don't really think, well, certainly not, you know, after the Bible, I don't think that this was actually done for very long, if it was done at all. It's certainly not done today, as far as I know. I hope not. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, Stephen, you have your hand up. If the wife is guilty. If she's guilty, he can divorce her and probably, oh. you know, probably not give her her ketubah. Um, but yeah. But, you know, if she's not guilty, or at least if the priest is determined that she's not guilty, then she gets to go home and, you know, her husband hasn't actually been very nice to her. Kim. Um, two two uh, kind of questions. One, um, I heard before that with that trial, um, if you're accused of having had an affair, that it that mixture is something that would stimulate miscarriage and that that's part of it. If you, is, is that something you've heard or is that you know what? probably? It could do that, it could do that, but you know, it's basically water with some dirt from the ground of the temple and then the, the name of God written on something and then melted into the water. I don't think it'd do okay. much to anybody. Yeah, uh, do you have um, another question? The, yeah, the other part is um, obviously by today's standards, a lot of the ketubah is kind of one-sided and, and potentially sexist. But it seems like kind of a pretty good deal um, in a society that doesn't have the protections of the state like we do. I mean, obviously, if Thomas and I got divorced, we'd have the state involved to divide properly, fairly. Um, and in a time when that didn't exist, it, you know, this is protection. Yes. Um, and so I was wondering, is that something that was common at the time or something that is more unique to early Judaism? Yeah, no, I think it's definitely unique to Judaism and it definitely is a protection of the woman. So despite the fact that she is being acquired and doesn't get a lot to say about it, she is being protected because of course in that society and the reason Tamar ended up sleeping with her father-in-law is because without a father, a son, a, uh, a husband, a woman really didn't have a whole lot, you know, to, to, to support her. So she had to have some male figure to support her. And in this case, if she's married and the guy decides he doesn't want her anymore, then he has to pay her. So at least she gets that. Now, in the Bible and up until the year 1000, men were actually allowed to marry more than one wife. And I would imagine, Stacy, and I'm going to look this up to make sure, but um, once somebody slept with another woman that become became their wife and the person the, the child would be an heir but i'm going to double check on that for modern times um but uh yeah i mean the man is allowed to marry several women and um you know i guess i guess you better have enough money to pay off all these ketubas if he decides to get divorced but as of the year 1000 there was a, uh, an edict sent out that uh, basically said, no, you cannot do that anymore. The only way you can have more than one wife is if a hundred rabbis agree to it. And actually there was a very recent case where a, a man wanted another wife and he got a hundred rabbis to say it was okay. So what can I tell you? Okay, Christine. Oh, you're muted. Yeah. I'm muted now. Uh, where did that case take place, just as a matter of interest? The one about the uh, the man who had an extra wife? 
Yeah. You know what? I'll look it up and I'll send you a link to it. Okay. It so my question about a year or two ago. My question was if, let's say you're living in or, uh, an Orthodox community in New York, you have a binding ketubah, and then the husband doesn't, you know, he says, no, I'm not going to pay attention to this. Do the, any of the courts, the civil courts recognize these as binding in any way that you're aware of? Well, we're going to talk about uh, divorce and how all of this works in a, in a little bit, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's complicated because um, yeah. if, if let's say you get, let's say you have a contract like that, 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 you know, the ketubah is a contract and people have signed it and witnessed it. I, I imagine that if the rabbinic court doesn't enforce it, then maybe the, uh, you know, the civil courts would, and there are probably instances where that's happened, but it's kind of complicated. So let, let's hold off on that until we get to the divorce section of, of this. Uh, okay. of this Thank you. So the chuppah is a bridal canopy and it's supposed to, so when you get married to somebody in the Jewish tradition, it's not just about we're having this one little ceremony to say we're married. It's about starting a Jewish home. So the chuppah is supposed to represent the home. And did you have your hand up again, Christine? Okay, it went up, it went down. Okay. so. It's basically supposed to be open and it's supposed to symbolize the openness of the tent that Abraham and Sarah had because they, they're supposed to be the representatives of hospitality. You may know the story in the Bible of Abraham who's just had a circumcision and he's sitting and sort of uh, recovering from that and three strangers come along in the desert and they come to his tent and he immediately washes their feet, offers them a meal that his wife is going to prepare for them. And so he is the epitome of hospitality, which the home is supposed to be as well. Also, the tabernacle in some ways can be thought of as the chuppah between God and, and Israel. And uh, according to the Midrash, which is uh, extra interpretations of what you see in the Bible and the Torah, God created 10 splendid chuppahs for the marriage of Adam and Eve. Okay, next please. All right, so now I wanna just go through the outline of the service. We've talked about a few of the key elements. So the first thing is, the first section is kiddushin, which as I said, is the, um, the uh, engagement. So now circling is traditional. Not everybody does circling uh, in terms of the kind of marriages that I've performed, but it's often done anyway. Traditionally, the bride is going to circle around the groom, and it'll be either three or seven times. And it's kind of to show that, you know, who's uh, each is she's under. When I do a wedding, which is an egalitarian wedding, I have the bride and the groom circle each other. So I have the bride circled the groom three times, the groom circling the bride three times, and then I have them do one circling together to show a mutuality. Then there's a wine blessing because anytime there's anything that's considered a happy occasion, a, a simcha in Judaism, there's always wine and a blessing with it, kiddush. Then you have the birkat erusin, which is the betrothal blessing. And that actually, the traditional one is about how this woman is now completely for the man in terms of uh, their, um, their sexual relations. And she's a virgin and, you know, he, she's not allowed to be with any other man is basically what this blessing says. So of course, because this blessing is offensive to most of us. I hope maybe to all of us. Um, we also have other possibilities for this. And I always give people a bunch of other options. There, there's a wonderful book, by the way, I should have made a, a copy of the cover. It's called The New Jewish Wedding by Anita Diamond. And um, she, uh, she, she really, this book is really, you know, has everything in it. I use it kind of as my, Bible. 
for weddings because she's got all the rules and all the options in there. So I'm going to give you a, an alternative version of this particular blessing. You are holy, Adonai, and your presence permeates the universe. Through your commandments, we share your holiness. You teach us to rejoice with the bride and groom, to celebrate their consecration to each other, to witness their vows to each other here beneath the bridal canopy. You are holy, Adonai, and you sanctify the union of your children underneath the wedding canopy. Because, and there's another one, I'll read another one, another option, blessed be the infinite, lifting us up through this holy celebration and awakening us to seek love and to sanctify our love through chuppah and through marriage. Blessed be the infinite, making the Jewish people holy through holy weddings. So this is a very beautiful way of saying what Birkat Erosin says in Hebrew, which is she can't be with any other man. And you don't drink the wine until after you said that blessing. And then the ring ceremony, which I had mentioned before, he says, hare, which means behold. At is you and ata is you in the masculine when she says it to him. Mekudeshet is consecrated and mekudash is consecrated in the masculine. Li to me. Betabaat means ring. Zu, this ring. Kedat, according to the law of Moshe of Israel, of Moses and Israel. That is the wedding vow, basically. And then usually between the Kiddushin and the Nisuin, there is a little break. And that's when you read the Ketubah. So usually in a Jewish wedding, you don't have vows. You know, I promise to love and whatever it is in the Christian ceremony. Um, because it's contained in the ketubah usually. And then after the ketubah reading, um, there's a wedding address to the couple where you say, you know, I've known, and actually this happens to be my son's cousin, I mean, my cousin's son and his wife, which I, uh, the wedding I did a few years ago, um, I will, you know, talk to them and say, you know, you've been together for three years and you've been through ups and downs and you've found ways to work things out or whatever it is that you want to say to them and your hopes for them in the future as they make their life together. Then is Nisuin, which is the actual technical uh, wedding the when they're really going to be married. And that consists of three things. The seven blessings, which we're going to go into in a moment. Breaking the glass, which there are many explanations for breaking the glass and therefore no one knows why, but one explanation is that it is to scare away evil spirits. Another is to remind us of the destruction of the temple. And therefore, even in our joy, we remember that, you know, there's been tragedies in our history. Also, you can think of it in terms of you know, if you break glass, it's very hard to put it back together. I've tried gluing glass and it does not work. So therefore a relationship is fragile and you have to be really careful not to break it. So there are a lot of interesting and different explanations and um, depending on what the couple likes, I, I will use one or another. And Yehud is a time for the couple to be alone together. So in the olden days, that was a time for them to consummate the marriage. Now it's just, I give people 10 or 15 minutes to be alone in a room somewhere where they can you know, just be together for the first time as a married couple before the onslaught of all the relatives and friends and all the celebration. So if you go to the next, uh, the next slide, we'll look at the seven blessings. Okay, right. it's Sheva Brachot is how you say it in Hebrew. And next, okay. So the first one is again, a blessing over the wine. And, oh, I have king of the universe. Oy, I should have changed that. Anyway, okay. That should be ruler of the universe to make it less masculine. Um, but this is the, um, actually the, pretty much the literal translation. So it is correct to say king of the universe. Because when you say, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, it means blessed are you Adonai our God, king of the universe. And we've tried to make it sound better by saying sovereign of the universe or ruler of the universe, but in the Hebrew, it really is king. And so creator of the fruit of the vine, again, celebrating this wonderful occasion with uh, some wine. The second one 
is, blessed are you, God, and I are God, etc., who has created everything for your glory. The third one is creator of human beings. We celebrate the fact that there are these human beings and we found our beshert, our special person. And then we acknowledge that God has fashioned human beings in God's image, according to God's likeness. And we just celebrate that again. The fifth one, and again, this is the literal translation. I wanted to have that here for you, but I do not ever use this literal translation. There are many, many, many alternatives. Um, and you can, there are people who don't even like using the word God. So it could be a source of life or whatever. Um, this fifth one, you definitely probably wanna use a, an interpretive version. Bring intense joy and exaltation to the barren one through the ingathering of her children amidst her in gladness. This is really referring to, it says here, Jerusalem, but also Rachel who was barren for a long time and who wept over the fact that her children first were not born and then that they went through so many tragedies. Okay, next slide, please. Gladden the beloved companions as you gladdened your creatures in the Garden of Eden. So we're wishing them the same happiness that um, Adam and Eve had when they got together. Adam and Eve, of course, being in the Garden of Eden would be the ideal concept of what it would be to have a happy life. And then the final one, blessed are you, Adam and I are God, who created joy and gladness, groom and bride, mirth, glad song, pleasure, delight, love, brotherhood, peace and companionship. Adam and I are God, let there soon be heard in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem, the sound of joy and the sound of gladness the voice of the groom and the voice of the bride, the sound of the groom's jubilance from their canopies and of the youth from their song-filled feasts. Blessed are you who causes the groom to rejoice with his bride. Okay, um, can you stop sharing? And I will share something because I'm gonna share the singing of the Sheva Brahot. Thank you. 
I'm going to stop it here. Just there's one more blessing, but I just want to give you a flavor of that. But I want to also show you this is an alternative version of the um, seven blessings. One of many, as I said, there are many, many, many. Uh, Anita Diamond in her book has a batch of them. And then you can find many on the internet. And I'm sure there are lots of other places. So the first one is blessed are you God, source of the world who creates the fruit of the vine. And then blessed are you God, light of life who created everything for your glory. So these aren't that different, just not king of the world. Blessed are you, are you God, spirit of all things who has created the human being. Then you get some that are a little more interesting. Blessed are you, God, foundation of every life, who fashioned humanity in your likeness and prepared for us a shape and form in your image from one generation to the next and for all eternity. So these are basically, you know, acknowledging God's creativity and generativity. And then the fifth blessing combines a wish for fertility with a prayer for redemptive unity at the end of days. Zion will surely celebrate and exult in the coming together of her children. Blessed are you, God, who brings joy to Zion through her children. And then, as I mentioned, the sixth blessing talks about the joy that the first couple experienced in the Garden of Eden. And then the seventh blessing will expand on that. Give pleasure to these beloved companions as you did to your creation in the Garden of Eden so long ago. Blessed are you, God, who makes the heart of this couple rejoice. And then this last one, which is often sung on its own because it's long and it's beautiful. Blessed are you, God, source of the universe, who has created each of these two people, their delight and their happiness, their rejoicing and singing, dancing and festivity, love and friendship, peace and pleasure. Oh God, may the voices of this celebration be heard in the streets of our cities and the hills of our countryside. May the words of this couple go out with gladness from their wedding chuppah, and may the music of their friends and guests surround them. Blessed are you, God, who brings joy to the hearts of this couple. So, as I said, there, there are a lot of different ways that you can um, re, re uh, interpret the prayers, make them something that's much more relevant to your life. Um, all right, so any, any questions? Because we're going to take a break for a few minutes. Uh, but before that, if anyone has questions, please feel yes, Carlos. Hi, Rabbi. I have Hi a there. quick I have a quick question. I don't know yeah. if this is something we'll cover in the future or not, but um I was just wondering what the wine means in Judaism. I know in Catholicism it's you know the blood of Christ and all that, but in Judaism I see it a couple of times. Sure right. What it means. Right. In Judaism it's obviously not related to that. It's it's that you know wine was not so cheap. And so for a special occasion, you pull out the bottle of wine and celebrate. Okay. That's basically it. Now, okay. you know, we do a kiddush every, every time we have a service, like on Friday night. Mm -hmm. um, now, often, like in our synagogue, we all, that kiddush is going to be with grape juice rather than wine. So that there are people who don't want to drink or who can't drink for one reason or another. So we, we try to keep grape juice. Uh, but traditionally, you would use something like Manischewitz. And I don't know how many of you have had Manischewitz, but it is not the most delicious wine, okay? It's like very sweet. Um, any other questions? Okay, yeah, Christine. You. And then I, Stacey. Uh, uh, the breaking of the glass. I, I've heard from my sister, two sisters-in-law that their grandmothers said that, they, that, that when you break the glass, when the groom breaks the glass, that it's, uh, and maybe they were kidding, but both of them said it, um, that, that the number of pieces is the number of children that you bring to the, ah. the, the it's like <laughs> easy, you know, right? it's like tread softly, right? But <laughs> as I said, there, there are many, many, many explanations, meaning no one knows really. Yeah. Although it, it could very well have been to scare away evil spirits in the early days. Um, another interpretation is that as, you know, we're happy, we're getting married, it's a wonderful occasion, but we think about the brokenness of the world, we don't forget that. So, you know, and you could probably make up your own too. Uh, Stacy, Thank you, Rabbi. I have three sidebar questions. One, I know it's called something else than a yarmulke, but what does that symbolize? 
Okay, so yarmulke is the Yiddish word, and in Hebrew is kippah. And there's no mitzvah, there's no commandment to wear a kippah, but it's supposed to be a sign of respect that you cover your head when you're in God's presence. Okay. I know most in our society, you take your hat off in God's presence, but I mean, in people's presence, that, that shows respect. But, you know, in, in the Jewish tradition, it's respect to put your kippah on. Okay. The other one, kosher food. Why is it so bland? I mean, <laughs> there could be like spices in it or salt, and it's just so bland. Well, I think, I think the kosher food you're thinking of is Ashkenazi and comes from, you know, Eastern Europe. And I guess they didn't use a lot of spices. Um, if you go to the Sephardic uh, tradition, it's going to taste very different. But, you know, one thing is with the meat. So kosher, I mean, there are a lot of rules, but one of them is that you slaughter the animal supposedly in the most humane way. Okay, you slit their throat. And you have to drain out all the blood. That's what it says in the Bible, right? The blood represents the, the life force of the animal, so you're not going to eat that. Um, and so you drain the blood and I suspect that draining the blood and then cooking the meat so there's no blood left is going to make it really uninteresting to eat. Okay. Okay. I personally don't eat meat, but in the days when I did, yeah. I mean, if you eat a steak that's been, you know, all the blood's been pulled out and you just keep cooking it until there's nothing left. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. All right, so the third one, I pretty much know the answer to, but we're talking about the uh, Hebrew name that we're going to choose. Yeah. Now, one of my concerns when we first met was if I do get accepted and I do make the transformation, that I won't be accepted as a Jew. Mm -hmm. And you really tell someone's nationality or religion by their last name. Mm -hmm. So instead of picking a, a first name, can I pick a last name or does it have to be a first name? You mean for your Hebrew name? Correct. Like what kind of last name are you thinking about? Something that's Jewish. Less Jewish? Why? Or like my last name is Italian. It's Marada. Uh-huh. So if I go to a synagogue and I'm Stacy Marada, they're going to be like, you're not Jewish. Right. So your Hebrew name would be I, I, oh, you're 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 saying can you change your last name? So oh, I see what you're saying. Name. I see. Well, first of all, you could be a Sephardic Jew with Marada. There's no way people are going to know. And by the way, these days there are a lot of Christines who are Jewish, and that is not a very Jewish name. Um, but the Hebrew name is for you know like how you're known in the Jewish community, and when you're called up to the Torah, they call you up by that name. But and you know, listen, okay. there are people who change their names, like there are people who. I have a colleague whose name was Jeff for most of his life, and then he decided to change it to Yossi. So you could do that if you wanted to, but look, I mean, Suzanne Singer, that's not necessarily a Jewish name either. Singer, it could be very Jewish. Isaac Bashevis Singer, I'm not related to him, um, but you know, it's also a very American name. And that wasn't our name actually. So a lot of, a lot of Jews actually have names that don't sound very Jewish because when our great grandparents came over here, they did not, well, there are various apocryphal stories. So the story I got was that when my great grandfather came over from Ellis Island, they couldn't pronounce his name. So they said, well, what do you like to do? He said, sing. And they said, your name is Singer. I have now been told by other people that that is all, you know, a, a, a bubba meister. It's a, you know, it's not a real story. It's a fairy tale. Um, I, I really don't know how it got changed. I do know that actually when I was growing up, which was in the 50s, our real name was a big family secret. And pronouncing it was almost like saying the, the un, uh, unnameable name of God, you know, the yud heh that only the high priest was allowed to pronounce once a year during Yom Kippur. So if I said the name, I felt like I was gonna be struck, you know, dead or something. Uh, my grandmother, who was married to my grandfather, whose name originally was this other name, told me she couldn't remember the name. She didn't know what it was because she wanted to be really assimilated. So that was what happened in those days. I had a, a friend in, in my uh, school whose na their original name, name was Lubert Chesky, and his father changed it to Lubin. So that happens all, happened a lot in those days. People did not want to be identified as Jewish. So, but again, Marada, you could be a Sephardic Jew. There's no, it, it's not necessarily anything except okay. it's Italian. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you.
there's something in Jewish tradition called a mamzer, which is sort of like a bastard. Um, a bastard in the technical sense of it, not in the sense of somebody being a bad person. So it is applied to the descendant of somebody of, of illicit unions. So it doesn't mean, for example, if one of the parents is not Jewish or something, that is not a mom's heir. It's somebody who comes from one of these unacceptable relationships. So uh, for example, you're not allowed to sleep with your sister or your mother-in-law, or, you know, those are the kinds of sexual relations that are um, not allowed. Okay. And if somebody has a child as a result of one of those relationships, they are considered a mom's heir. But it has to be two Jews that, that do this. Okay. And then there are two categories of mom's heir. Um, there's incest. And then there's also the child born of a married woman's adulterous relationship. That would be again. Remember, we said adultery is only because a married woman is involved with someone who's not her husband. Uh, whoever's uh, not muted, could you mute yourself, please? Thank you. Um, so, the child of a single woman and a man she could lawfully have married is not a mom's heir. Okay, so if they just happen to have an affair, they're not married, they have a child, that is not considered a mom's heir. And as I said before, it's irrelevant if the man is married or not. Um, and then one more thing, because the question was about inheritance. A mom's heir was deemed a son and brother in respect to rules of inheritance, leveret marriage and conduct towards parents. Okay, so all that to say that in traditional Judaism, there is this notion that if you are the result of an illicit coupling, you are considered a mom's heir. Now, there are three categories of people. Now, again, this is not in our world of Reform Judaism, but it is in the world of Orthodox and some conservative. There's the Kohen, which is the priest. They're at the top. Then there's a the regular Israelite. And then there's the mom's heir. And if you are a mom's heir, you can only marry another mom's heir. You cannot marry a regular Israelite. Again, this is not anything we pay attention to when in the reform world. Um, in terms of even being called up to the Torah, there's a hierarchy. So the first person who gets called up to the Torah to read the Torah is from the Kohen, the Kohen, the Kohanim family. The next one is from the Levite family and then the Israelites. Um, but so there are strict rules about who can marry whom. Again, not in reform Judaism, but that is the way the, um, society was set up in the olden days. So, but the moms there can still inherit. Um, are there any other questions before we go on to same-sex marriage? Although there's one more thing that I, we didn't, there's one um, slide that we didn't share. So uh, Brandon, if you wouldn't mind sharing the slide that comes uh, right after that, uh, before, yeah, after this, after this, yeah because somebody had asked about breaking the glass. So the ceremony reaches its climax with both the bride and groom drinking wine. So after you say the seven blessings, that's when you drink the wine. Um, and then the groom steps on the glass. Now, sometimes you can have the bride and the groom uh, breaking the glass. And it, as I said, there's several interpretations. It represents the sorrow over the destruction of the temple. We remember the brokenness of the world. Um, I'll tell you a funny story about the breaking of the glass, which is, it's very important that you have a glass that breaks easily. Um, do you mind uh, stopping sharing for just a second? Okay, so a lot of times people will use a light bulb because it's breaking of glass. It doesn't have to be a glass as in you know one of these things, but you can either take a very thin wine glass or you can take a light bulb or something like that. So I did a wedding at uh, the temple and they had a very thick glass. And you, of course, have to put it either in a little pouch or, you know, in a napkin or something, because you don't want all the shards to go off, suggesting you're going to have like, you know, 15 children um, and, uh, you know, go pierce anybody. So they had this very thick piece of glass and 
the guy kept stomping on it and it wouldn't break. And finally, it shot out of the pouch out into the congregation. So that was a little bit embarrassing for the poor guy. Um, another time I did a wedding on a beach. Ooh, that's not the greatest place to break glass because uh, it's not very solid. And the guy who's getting married was barefoot. <laughs> so he had to get his father to lend him a, uh, a shoe. Anyway, so, I mean, I have some amusing tales about weddings, you know, like um, I did a wedding in, where's it, Fallbrook, I think, near here. That was when I first was here many, many years ago as an interim, like about 15 years ago. And it was in September. And does it ever rain in September? No, right? So the one day in the year in September, okay? So we're there, this beautiful setting. And they, the chuppah was not a real chuppah. It was just this beautiful outdoor thing that didn't move. And um, everybody was dressed in these long, beautiful dresses. And it poured, poured and poured and poured for hours. And they kept waiting for it to stop. And guess what? It never did. So we ended up, there was a tent that was set up for the, for the dinner. And what I did was I took off my talit, my prayer shawl, and I used that as a chuppah and I had people hold it up. And so, you know, the poor bride and the bridesmaids are all coming in with mud trailing along their dresses and everything. So, but it was actually a nice thing to have people holding up the chuppah. And because it's hard to keep your arms up like this for very long, a lot of people took turns. So it was actually, it turned out to be a really nice thing. And then another time I did a wedding and it was out in um, Redlands at the uh, alumni house uh, at the university, very beautiful location, middle of the summer, beating hot, not an umbrella in sight. And I've done a few like that. If anybody here wants to ever get married in the summer, make sure there's some umbrellas for the poor older people. It was hot. And, you know, as I said, there was a meal outside and everybody was melting. But anyway, I get there and I check it out and I say to the uh, wedding coordinator, please make sure that we have wine in the glass, you know, for the blessing. Yeah, no problem. So we do our procession into the hoppa. I turn around, I pick up the glass in order to do the blessing and there's nothing in it. So I thought, do I stop the wedding and start all over again? Or do I just said to them, pretend. So, you know, I'm sure we all have many, many, many stories of different weddings, either our own or other people. And there's always some kind of mishap but it's not about the perfection of the ceremony. Okay, so uh, let's go on with the next slide, which is about the same gender. Great, thank you. So in the year 2000, the CCAR, which is the Central Conference of American Rabbis, passed a resolution saying that, whereas justice and human dignity are cherished Jewish values, and whereas in March of 99, the Women's Rabbinic Network passed a resolution urging the Central Conference of American rabbis to bring the issue of honoring ceremonies between two Jews at the same gender to the floor of the convention plenum. Very long sentence. And whereas the institutions of reform Judaism have a long history of support for civil and equal rights for gays and lesbians and, next slide, whereas North American organizations of the reform movement have passed resolutions in support of civil marriage for gays and lesbians, therefore we do hereby resolve that the relationship of a Jewish same gender couple is worthy of affirmation through appropriate Jewish ritual. And further resolve that we recognize the diversity of opinions within our ranks on this issue. We support the decision of those who choose to officiate at rituals of union for same gender couples. And we support the decision of those who do not. And next slide, further resolve that we call upon the CCAR to support all colleagues in their choices in this matter and further resolve that we also call upon the CCAR to develop both educational and liturgical resources in this area. Okay, please stop sharing. Okay, so it's, it's interesting that this has changed a lot, but let's say about 20 or 30 years ago, it would be very difficult to find a rabbi who would do a, an interfaith marriage, but, they would do a same gender marriage because the idea of marriage in Judaism is supposed to be between two Jews. That is the kind of ceremony it is. It's a ceremony for two Jews. And even though I have done interfaith marriages and I continue to do them, I understand where those rabbis were coming from. Many, many, many of them have changed their positions because what ends up happening is you have 
people who grew up in your synagogue and then they decide to get married and they know that you don't do interfaith marriages and so they don't even come talk to you. And a lot of rabbis have kind of lost relationships with people because of that. The other thing is, quite frankly, the reform movement has been very welcoming of interfaith couples but a lot of rabbis wouldn't do the ceremony. So it seems a little bit hypocritical, even though I understand where they're coming from, to say, I won't perform the wedding, but once you're married, you're welcome to come into the synagogue. And so what would happen also in those cases would be people who had gone to a rabbi to say, I'd like to get married, would you do it? And they would say, no, even if they had a really good reason and it was coming out of a place of integrity, people got turned off to Judaism and maybe never came back. And it, as it turns out, people who are interfaith, a lot of times they're very involved in the synagogue. The non-Jewish spouse is very involved in the synagogue. And actually, I just uh, heard a really beautiful sermon that was given by a young woman who's a, a fairly new rabbi of color about all the different blessings that are brought to a community by people who are different. So, that's not a problem for me, but it was for many rabbis. As I said, many people have changed their minds since then. Um, interfaith, I mean, um, same gender marriages. Um, again, it's, it's you know, up to each rabbi. There's some, I guess, who don't, but we ordain people who are gay and we ordain people who are transgender. And we have made a big effort to make our places of worship welcoming to people were transgender, gay, interfaith, whatever. Um, so yes, I have performed interfaith marriages. The problem is that, you know, for a long time it wasn't legal. So I remember a number of years ago, it was legal for about a month here. And then we had to wait for the Supreme Court decision to finally make it legal all the way. Um, but, uh, you know, it also has to be recognized by the community that you're living in. I mean, I could, I could perform a, a wonderful wedding and if it's not, you know, considered to be a legal wedding, then, uh, you know, you unfortunately have to be under the laws of the land. So now that I've introduced that subject, Bobby or Beverly, did you have specific questions about this? Yeah, do you have? I, I had one that, um, what about interfaith uh, renewal of vows, same sex, same thing? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, you know, if you're asking me specifically, yes, I, I, I would do that. And, you know, I think at this stage, especially out here, I think, you know, most rabbis will do that. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah, that was, that's what you were going to yeah. ask. It's kind of on our minds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, sometimes I suggest to people who, you know, decide that they're going to uh, convert then maybe they want to do some sort of Jewish wedding, you know, if they're already married and do it under the chuppah and, you know. Oh, yeah. 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 It was very interesting because just listening um, when you did the audio of the Jewish ceremony, I got very verklempt, <laughs> you know what I mean? And I thought, well, I've just didn't, didn't have that, you know, and yeah. now maybe I can have it, you know, yeah, of course. it was really kind of interesting. Of course. For me. Yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. And they're, you know, actually, um, Rabbi Denise Egger was the editor of a new prayer book that has um, a lot of, you know, liturgy for um, gay, lesbian, transgender. Um, and there's definitely wedding ceremonies that have been written for, for that. And I mean, I've done them, so I, I, I have them. But um, other questions? Was it controversial? Oh, there it is, Carlos. Here, wait a minute. Oh, yes. Let me uh, let me uh, spotlight you for a second so you can show that to everybody. Wait a second. Hello, right here. <laughs> there it is. Oh, Where pride dwells. Oh, wow, nice. that's nice. Because Carlos, you attend that that synagogue. Correct. Yes. Yes. Thank you for showing that. <laughs> Was it controversial in the Riverside uh, in your Riverside synagogue? Well, actually, before. I came here, there was a, um, a rabbi who was gay. He really? had been, he had been married and had children. And then he, um, he came out as gay. And I think there might've been one or two people that didn't like it, but for the most part, it was fine. Um, 
and I haven't gotten any any pushback. I mean, we have a number of gay couples and a number of gay people in our our community, and they're just part of the community. It's no no big deal. Yeah. And we have an all gender bathroom too, <laughs> which I made sure we had. Impressive. Very very impressive. <laughs> okay. Yes, David. I was just curious, do the, um, if they're gay, um, do, would they have a different, like a different, a different wedding than the um, Orthodox Jews? So if we're, we, we would be liberal Jews, yes. but Orthodox are very different. Oh. So they, right? Yeah, the Orthodox do not ordain gay people. They, they don't, don't, have, they don't even like gay people, right? <laughs> not, they, well, they figure you need some help. Exactly. Yeah. They're very different. It's just so hard, you know, because when you say you're Jewish, you know, people don't understand yes. all this. I mean, this is fantastic, but who knows yeah. all that? You know? Well, you know, it's interesting in terms of um, gay uh, ordination, the reform movement said we ordain gay people. The conservative movement, as always, was split in two. There's the East Coast and the West Coast. The West Coast said no problem. The East Coast said problem. Um, actually, so it's interesting. There is as you saw a resolution saying that we can perform same gender marriages and it's up to the you know, particular rabbi to make the decision. Um, there is no similar resolution about interfaith marriages. Now I'm allowed to do an interfaith marriage. It doesn't jeopardize me. If I were a conservative rabbi, they don't allow you to do it. And in fact, they used to kick you out of the rabbinic assembly if you um, actually even attended one. I don't know whether that's still the case right now, but um, so, and, and the idea is not that we don't like people who are, you know, Christian. It's more that, you know, there's a fear of we will lose our continuity as a Jewish people. But, you know, I'm going to send you actually a link to this sermon um, and you'll see her argument is really beautiful. Um, okay, so we're going to go on to divorce because, of course, if we talk about marriage, we also have to talk about divorce. Now, interestingly, uh -oh. I wanted to see if I could do a comment real quick. Yeah, please. Could you turn that on? No. Yeah. So the comment that I had is the con continuity within the Jewish community, because of the whole problem with interfaith, that's part of the reason why I wasn't able to get my continuous education. So that's that's one of the challenges that I want to help within the community is see that we can have interfaith and also have a continuous education because I was, uh, my education was disconnected because I was a child of interfaith. Well, that's, that's really unfortunate. I want to see. You know, it, we have a lot of interfaith families and the kids go to school and they're just treated like everybody else and they have bar and bat mitzvahs and the whole bit. So I'm sorry that that was your experience. Um, you know, and unfortunately I think many people have had that experience but hopefully not recently um, but yeah, we'll work on that together. Okay, so um, divorce. In order to get divorced, now people talked about the ketubah versus civil issues. Thank you, Carlos just put the name of that um, prayer book in the chat if anybody wants to copy it. So I can get married by a rabbi and just do the Jewish part of it and not have the final, you know, by the power vested in me by the state of California, I now pronounce you husband and wife. That formula has to be said in order for it to be a, you know, legal marriage in most of the states here. Okay, if I only do the, the Jewish part, it's not really a legal marriage, but what's happened is often people will say, you know, I don't want to lose my social security or whatever it is that I get because if I get married, I'll lose this benefit or that benefit. So can we just have a Jewish wedding and not make it a legal wedding? And that's actually pretty much not okay. And sometimes the civil authorities will say, well, you know, you had this Jewish ceremony and we're gonna count that as a real wedding. It's complicated. But on the other side of that, let's say I get married and I decide to get divorced. Okay, if I'm in a reform situation, I go to the judge and I get a civil divorce, go through whatever process I have to go through, period. That's the end of the story. That is not the case in the Orthodox world. In the Orthodox world, the civil dissolution of the marriage is not enough. 
you also have to get a religious dissolution of the, of the marriage. And if you don't, you'll see what happens. And that's very unfortunate, unless you want to leave the, if you want to leave the Orthodox world and say, well, I'm not going to, you know, accept that condition. Okay. But if you want to stay in the Orthodox world, you can't just, you know, do it that way. So let's go to the next slide, please. Okay. A divorce is called a get. And here's what it says on the day of the week and the same way of, of showing when in, uh, you know, this is happening during the course of a week and a month and whatever, since the creation of the world, similar kind of formula. And then according to the numbering we're accustomed to in the town of whatever it is, for some reason in the traditional one, they talk about the river it's near. We don't have that problem here. We have a riverside. Um, I, the son of so-and-so here in this town near the river, consent of my own will and release my wife whose name is such and such. Okay, next one. And she's been my wife and I release her and I send her away and put her aside that you can have permission now to go and marry another man. Okay, and no other man is gonna stop you from doing this. You're permitted to another man, da 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 da. Okay, what do you notice? Let's go back to being all together and stop sharing. What do you notice about this? What do you notice about the divorce? That is. <laughs> oh, that's a dog. I, I was trying to figure out. Okay, go ahead, Brandon. That it can only be initiated by the man. Exactly. It can only be initiated by the man. It cannot be initiated by the woman. Okay. That this is in traditional. Now I have been in, you know, in a situation where somebody was getting divorced in the reform movement and they wanted to get, and you know, we we fashioned something egalitarian. But in the traditional world, the man has to initiate it. He has to hand it to the woman. It has to come into her hands. Okay even if he throws it at her and she has, she has to catch it, okay? It has to come into her hands. What happens when he doesn't wanna divorce her? Next slide, please. Okay, she becomes what's called an aguna. A woman whose husband has either abandoned her or being absent has not been heard of from some time. Okay, it could be that he abandoned her. It could also be that he doesn't wanna give her a divorce. If there's no proof of her death or she doesn't have a bill of divorce from him, her status of, as a wife remains forever unchanged. For Jewish law does not admit the presumption of death from a prolonged absence merely, nor can a wife obtain a divorce from an absent husband. So what happens if this guy wants to go off and, you know, ah, I just wanna you know, live somewhere else. Maybe I wanna find another wife and I uh, didn't bother giving you a divorce. Next slide, please. According to Jewish law, when a couple gets divorced, the man who must present the woman with a bill of divorce called a get, okay? Without one, the couple is still viewed as married. That's even if a civil divorce is obtained. So in the past, if a woman was, ref was refused a divorce because a man would not give his wife a get, the rabbis of the local Jewish community were authorized under certain circumstances to force the husband to do so. So they could force him, that's if he's around, right? If he's not around, you can't really force him. However, since the Enlightenment local Jewish communities lost their autonomous status and the Jewish community lost its civil powers to enforce marriage and divorce laws. So in other words, before we became citizens of various countries, we lived in ghettos and we were sort of semi-autonomous and the community was run by the rabbi in terms of legal issues. And the, the rabbis could say, okay, you're gonna have to divorce your wife. They don't have that ability anymore. Now they can pressure the husband, they can humiliate him, but they cannot force him. The unintended result was that rabbis lost the power to force a man to give his wife a get. And Jewish law does not allow a woman to give a get to her husband. And she's not allowed to remarry and she's called an aguna, a chained woman. So, as I said, 
you know, if you're in a tight community and the husband refuses to give his wife a get and the rabbis determine in a court of three rabbis that he should be giving her a divorce, let's say he won't have sex with her or whatever it is he's doing, maybe he's being abusive, they can make him feel really awful and they can call him out or maybe publish something in the local newspaper. And maybe that will compel him to actually give his wife a get. But otherwise, no. So I'm going to show you, if you could stop sharing, I'm going to share something. Um, I'm going to show you a little clip of a film called Get, about a woman who's trying to get one and who's not able to because her husband won't do it. Okay, so you can see that this is a huge problem for that particular community. So there are a few things that have been tried to make this better. So let's look at the last few slides, please. So as I said, one way is to try to impose communal sanctions, so both social and financial. So you could announce the name of this uh, husband uh, every Shabbat in synagogue and say, this man you know, won't give his wife a get. He's a bad guy. Uh, you could put it in the newspaper, as I mentioned. And you could call on members of the community to avoid social and economic relations with somebody like that. Sometimes you can ban a man from coming into the synagogue. Doesn't mean he's going to agree to it, right? But those are things you can try. Next slide, please. A second approach is to solve the problem through the civil legal system. So in New York state where there are a lot of Jews and a lot of Orthodox and ultra Orthodox Jews, there's a get law which says the plaintiff must remove all barriers that would prevent his spouse's remarriage before a civil divorce could be granted. You know, I'm sure that's controversial law. Uh, next. A third approach is to sign a prenuptial agreement. So in the 1980s, the RCA's Commission on Divorce, so that is the uh, Orthodox, chaired by Rabbi Avner Weiss, who is a particularly progressive Orthodox rabbi. It states that the bride and groom agree that in the case of a dissolution of the marriage by either divorce or annulment, each party consents to a get. And that is the husband agrees to issue the get and the wife agrees to accept it. There is recognition in the agreement that the refusal of either party to give or receive the get results in actual damage to the party, then kept unable to remarry against his or her will. Compensation for that damage is agreed to in advance by a specified per diem sum. So that's one approach. And then the, the other approach next is the Lieberman clause. So 
Saul Lieberman developed a clause, and this is in the conservative movement, that's added to the ketubah. In effect, it's an arbitration agreement used in the case of a divorce. So if the marriage is dissolved and the woman is re was refused to get from her husband, both the husband and wife were to go to a rabbinic court authorized by the Jewish Theological Seminary, which is the conservative seminary, seminary and heed their directives, which could and usually did include ordering a man to give his wife a get. Okay, that's, that's the end of the slideshow. So there have been various attempts to try to deal with this problem. And, you know, a prenup has to be agreed to by both parties. The Lieberman clause would be in the conservative movement anyway. And so, you know, this is a real problem for women in a traditional community because, as I said, you, you cannot get remarried, right? And your child is going to be a momzer. So that is not too cool. Okay. I don't want to end on a grim note. I, I'll take your question in a second. But, you know, obviously we are not in that community here. We're not in the traditional Orthodox community. And so, therefore, we don't have that particular problem. Okay, Christine and then, uh, well, Christine Daly and then Christine Roberts. Well, the question I had is, uh, you know, I have a, a friend in Haifa who's been trying to get a get for like eons and her uh, husband who's estranged at this point is using it as a, as a vehicle for extortion. Right. And right. Um, that, and, and in fact, there was one case uh, I don't remember how long ago in Brooklyn, where one of the rabbis on the court was accused of of taking bribes to refuse gets. There you go. So real problems. It, it is really bad. Yeah. yeah. Christine Roberts. So yeah, what is the position of the Orthodox community in particular if a woman is um, the victim of domestic violence? Uh, well, they have to, first of all, believe that that's true. And I, you know, there've been articles in the, in the newspaper about domestic violence that's sort of swept under the rug. I mean, as you saw in that film, just from that clip, and I do recommend watching the film, it's, it's really a very good film. Um, you get the, a bait dean in the Orthodox community is going to be three men. And you saw those three men, how sympathetic they were to her situation. I, I'm not going to trash the Orthodox community, but I'm going to say, you know, they're not necessarily going to be as uh, sympathetic to the woman as as maybe a different kind of court might be. I mean, that happens to the American court system as well. But and of course, all of this is is subject to bribes and various other things, you know, and biases. I mean, the bias is to keep the marriage together and also, you know, not to humiliate the the, the husband because you know his wife wants to divorce him. If he wants to divorce her, that's another story. Um, other other comments or questions? Yes, uh, Beverly. Okay, there. Um, it's very sad to me um, that so much of the conversation, like if you're if you're following masks and you see that the Orthodox community in Brooklyn are against it, you know, so much of what we hear about Judaism is usually from ultra orthodox or orthodox which is not i mean that's why what you're doing is so amazing because there's so much misunderstanding about what judaism is and how do you combat that you know what what do you do because it's it's it, those are the stories that get attention you know in the media more than oh you know what you're doing for example and uh, I, I couldn't agree with you more and um you know as as you may note in popular culture, very often when there's an image of a rabbi, what does the rabbi look like? It's a man with a beard, right? Exactly. Even some of the, like there's something called PJ Library, which is wonderful. It has all these wonderful children's books and they get distributed to kids all over the community. But I cannot tell you how many times I've read a story to the kids and the rabbi is a man with a beard. And luckily, by the way, the first time that women were ordained in the United States was in 1972 in the reform Ooh. movement. And so there've been a lot of women rabbis for you know many decades to the point now where there are kids who go, oh, you mean a man can be a rabbi? Because they grew up in a synagogue with a you know woman rabbi. 
<laughs> What's the percentage of men to women rabbis in the, uh, in the uh, reform? Uh, I think at this point it's probably about a third. Oh, yeah, it's pretty good. So, um, any other questions about any of this? Yes, please, Melissa. Yeah. We talked about all marriage, the different types of marriage and everything being accepted. What if you don't want to be married? Is that okay as well? Because I mean, uh, you know, I'm 35. I don't want to be married. I never have, but I have a boyfriend. And so I wonder if that's okay if I were to continue that. Hey, it's fine with me. Again, <laughs> you, you have to um, distinguish between the Orthodox world and the reform world, okay? Because in the Orthodox world, no, it's not okay to live together. You get married young, you have a lot of kids. Um, in the reform world, you know, no. As I said last week about, you know, circumcision, some people circumcise, well, most people circumcise, but many people don't. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's not officially okay, but there are rabbis who accept that and who will do a baby naming and, and a welcoming into the covenant, even for uh, children who have not been circumcised. So it just depends on the community you're in. Yes, uh, look, Bobby and then Christine. Okay. Um, what happens if in the conservative community, if a woman's husband goes missing for any number of reasons, yeah, well, that's that the whole thing about the Aguna, because if he's missing, he can't give her a divorce. So she, that's too bad for her yep. for the rest of her life. Yep. Okay. Wow. Yep. Okay, mm -hmm. Christine. To, to Melissa's point, um, uh, my friends in Toronto, um, both, uh, she was reared in a, in a Orthodox uh, family and uh, split that way a long time before. And he was a red diaper Jew. Okay. It's like he was a, a lefty Jew for a long time. And they got together eons ago, right? 26 years. They had two children. The children had bar and bat mitzvahs. Da, 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 da. And they finally got married, right? And, and they got married. And uh, the reason that they gave was that her medical benefits were better than his. Okay. And this was perfectly acceptable to their reform rabbi. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, you know, I don't, I, I don't feel like people have to get married. You know, do whatever. That's great to hear because I feel like, yeah, maybe one day for, again, medical reasons or, you know, whatever happens, of course. But I mean, I'm in no rush to do any of that anytime soon. So it's good to hear that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, anybody else? I, I, ask a question about anything. We have five more minutes. You can ask a question about anything. Doesn't have to be about marriage. Melissa, go ahead. Uh, are a lot of Jewish people vegetarian just because it seems so much easier? To, to There's to some, I mean, you know, again. Like laws it would make sense. I mean, I'm vegetarian anyways, but it seems like the easy choice. Yeah, well, I mean, some people are ve vegetarian and, you know, some people keep kosher and some people eat pork and shrimp. <laughs> I went to a restaurant once with my mother-in-law, who's Jewish, and uh, they, they were serving lobster. She goes, you want a lobster? I go, I don't eat shellfish. She goes, but nobody's looking. And it's not about who's looking. It's about, you know, what your belief system is. But um, yeah, there's some people who are vegetarian. It makes it a lot easier. Christine? Yeah, my nephew and his uh, his husband were married, um, you know, uh, with a, a really lovely rabbi that we've known forever. And uh, up in Maine, okay, which is where they had a summer house. Okay, so it was outside, of course, because it was a beautiful summer day. And there was something that would pass as a chuppah, but uh, his husband is not Jewish. Okay. And... Um, and for the uh, for the wedding feast, it's Maine. Of course, there was lobster bisque. <laughs> Look, it's Maine, right? And uh, and half of the islanders were lobster fisher people, and they were there. And you know, so the the, the there's an inclusion element that comes into play. In well, the I have definitely been to weddings, bar mitzvahs, etc., where they served a table filled with shellfish. And yeah. you know what? I, it's not my business. 
yeah. We don't do it in the synagogue. Like in the synagogue, we. Yeah. Hmm? For me, I'm vegetarian except for my niece's brisket, which is okay. to die for. <laughs> but um, we um, you know, in the temple we don't serve pork or shellfish. We don't mix milk and meat. But if somebody's going to have a simcha, a happy occasion, and they want to celebrate it that way somewhere else, that is not my business. And as I said, I've been to plenty where, you know, you had a nice Jewish wedding, a nice Jewish bar mitzvah, and they supposedly are conservative. And then you go to the party and it's a table filled with clams and oysters and whatever. So and then you go to Israel, which is one of the most vegetarian friendly places on the entire planet. I mean, it is, uh, I mean, I think one Bay, the Jewish community in the Bay Area, I mean, to a certain degree in LA, but certainly in the Bay Area, there was a lot of vegetarian options, but Israel was uh, pretty incredible as far as what they, uh, what they offer as far as, I mean, obviously for kosher, but also for vegetarian, but also brings back the lecture, and I forgot her name, Rabbi, that she just did a lecture for us on veganism. In oh, right. No, she's not a rabbi, but she's studying to be one, yeah. There's the whole vegan, too. Jewish vegan uh, organization. Yeah, and that was fascinating because I think that that's a lot that is happening. I know it's been also spurred on by a lot through Hillel and a lot of the Hillel groups on college campuses. What they do is primarily vegetarian now because then it's not an issue from a kosher standpoint. Right, right. That, right. Another thing that I would have noticed uh, since turning vegetarian is that it's maybe a way that people interpret bringing peace onto the earth is through vegetarian or vegan diets. And that right. might be the reason why vegetarianism is becoming more and more common in the Jewish community is that they're extending this peace uh, beyond from humanity onto other creatures. So, right. I could be, right. it's just me shooting in the dark about what, why their, my, their community might be rising, uh, rising in vegetarianism. Well, I'll tell you, because the kosher, the whole kosher thing is supposed to be to treat the animals the most humanely way possible. Unfortunately, sometimes maybe the slaughter is done with the quick knife across the, uh, the throat, but it doesn't mean that the conditions in the um, in the slaughterhouse are okay. Uh, there's a really good book called Postville about a place in Ohio, uh, not Ohio, Iowa, um, a slaughterhouse. Uh, uh, I can't remember the name of it right now, but it was the biggest kosher animal slaughterhouse, and they were treating the animals horribly, and they were treating the workers horribly. And long story short, it was closed down eventually. So just because you're following the letter of the law, you're not necessarily following the spirit of the law. So sometimes just not eating meat at all is a way to try to respect the life of the animal. Um, okay, so we're at three o'clock. I just wanna remind everybody that next week we are not having a class because there's a, um, a congregational meeting. So at the same time, but we'll resume the week after and um, I will send you some stuff. And uh, Che, I, I, I don't know why I have the wrong email for you, but I will send you all the stuff that, you're, that you were missing because I've sent some stuff out, which obviously you didn't get. Okay. Okay, I got it from the office. So something was wrong in the way they conveyed it to me. So you haven't gotten any emails from me, right? No, no, it's been about over a week, I think, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. Well, I'll fix that. And uh, thank you all for finding us here. Next week, we'll, I mean, the week after, we'll be back in our regular Zoom room. So have a good couple of weeks and I hope to see you at services and other things. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye everybody. Thank you. Bye everybody. Bye. Thank you and bye.